Good morning and welcome to this virtual session uh, given, uh, given COVID-19 to look at water sanitation hygiene and also to look at what the implications of this are going to be in the near future. We have, uh, we're going to have a conversation with uh, chief executives of a very diverse set of organizations working all over the country. So we have Ghazala Paul from Samarth Trust. Uh, Ghazala is the managing uh, trustee and founder of Samarth Trust. They work in Kutch in Gujarat and Kabir Dham in Chhattisgarh. We have Libby Johnson, who's the uh, chief executive of Gram Vikas in Orissa. Gram Vikas is uh, one of the premier organizations that has actually worked on uh, providing access to pipe water supply to households on scale in this country. Uh, we have Sundar Rajan uh, joining us from Indram Foundation in Anand. Uh, Sundar uh, Indram Foundation works in several states in the country, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, particularly at this point of time. Uh, but uh, uh, Indram Foundation is uh, probably the leader on looking at issues around water quality uh, in this country. So uh, we have Sundar with us. We have Tini from Aga Khan Development Network. The Aga Khan Development Network works in Bihar, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, uh, on issues uh, that include water sanitation and hygiene. We have Vedika Bandarkar, who's the managing director of water.org, uh, which is India's sort of lead institution, which looks at microfinance and uh, water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, so it's great to have Vedika with us. And finally, we have Yamini Ayer, who's the president of Center for Policy Research, one of India's uh, premier independent think tanks and policy institute. So welcome all of you to this conversation. Uh, I'm not going to start off by a, a you know, long preface or anything, and I'll jump straight uh, to this chat. Uh, what I'm going to request is that uh, uh, if there are, for, for, the, for the audience, for those who are following this uh, on, online, uh, if there are any questions that you'd like to pose to a specific panelist uh, or questions that like you'd like to pose in general, then please use the chat, uh, the question and answer box at the bottom. Uh, we will make time for question and answers as we go along. I'm going to start off by inviting all our panelists today uh, to essentially, uh, you know, start off with some opening remarks on what do you see as the challenges uh, to water sanitation and hygiene that either COVID-19 or the lockdown have brought into focus. Um, Ghazala, would you like to start? Yeah, I think uh, uh, there has been, uh, you know, because in any way our country is, has a lot of water issues, you know, there are water scarce region, there's desert like Kutch where, you know, this time is very, very tough for them. And with COVID, I think it has brought in more challenges because uh, people have to buy water. And, uh, you know, when there's no food, there's no money, there's no work. Uh, how do you buy? How do you buy water? So then it becomes a very very challenging uh, process because you know if you need water to wash your hands, you have to be, you know, you have to take you have to bathe every day, uh, which is actually culturally it wasn't there in the in the in the areas where you know like where there is less water or there is in you know, a desert. In the desert, the culture is to, uh, to use water very sparingly. So that has been a big challenge, and uh, we are we are looking at how we want to address this challenge. Thanks, Ghazala. Should we move to Libby? So Libby, what's been your experience of the impact of COVID-19 or the lockdown on water sanitation hygiene in parts of Urissa that Gram Vikas works or even in Jharkhand where you all work? Yeah. So uh, overall, I think there is a greater sense of understanding because there's a lot of talk about hand wash. There's been some laws against spitting in public that has brought in some attention to hygiene issues that is badly needed. But, uh, you know, water per se, there have been some whispers about water conservation while washing hands, but I don't think that has reached uh, to, the, to the, the last mile. I think overall we need to re-emphasize wash issues the way, a way much more than what we have done so far, particularly in the context of the rural and the poor communities. And I, I say this for, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, March, April is the best time for most construction work in the water sanitation sector. And we've lost precious 60 days of a lot of work that could have happened. 
the lockdown has led to increase in price of materials. There is a shortage of materials now, even after the lock. I mean, the state go state governments have started allowing work. Materials have not reached. Uh, cement prices have reached. I mean, increased substantially. So that's going to you know really affect a lot of the projects that are uh, that are in progress. The other thing is about the reverse migration that's happening. Um, we estimate that the uh, the population of villages are going to increase at least by 20 percent which means the need for water is increasing to that proportion. And um, a lot of toilets that are not connected to water supply, the load on uh, women and young girls to fetch water for use of toilets is increasing and we are seeing that. Um, um, therefore, the incidence of open defecation in many of these villages where it had become uh, you know, matter of past and matter of history, we're fearing that a lot of that will, uh, will come back. The, uh, other area, minor area, I mean, not minor area, but uh, where things have started coming out is adolescent girls who used to get their sanitary pads from schools. Now that supply line is stopped. There isn't enough money in the families to buy these pads. The final point I would talk about is the disposal of masks because of, with a lot of uh, reverse uh, migration that happens, youngsters come back with masks, you know, surgical masks bought in the market. Disposing them is now posing a new solid waste management challenge in the villages. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. Uh, should we go quickly to Sundar? Sundar, what do you see as sort of the new challenges that have emerged uh, with regard to what sanitation hygiene, either due to COVID or the lockdown? Thanks, Madhavan, for uh, <clears throat> inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, yes, definitely, you know, there's almost nothing which is not affected uh, by the current situation of COVID and the lockdown. And uh, almost every aspect of life has, you know, there has had been some impact. And uh, if you like the nature of the issue itself, the nature of COVID itself, uh, wash and hand wash is an integral part of it. The biggest response to it is hand wash, something uh, something that many of us take for granted, but um, is a big luxury for uh, for many people in uh, in rural parts of India, where uh, there is no pipe water supply, where there is lack of water during this period. And then things like um, soaps and sanitizers are also stuff which many people have never seen. Right? So it starts from there and then uh, many other things I will echo, which um, you know, also Ghazala spoke about and others and Libby, uh, the fact about in some of our places, we see that uh, there is water facility, there is, uh, acts, there is, you know, there are these services, but they're not accessible. Uh, so people are ending up paying a lot of money uh, to access water. I'll talk about a uh, few of these examples from, from our places, but I feel that uh, in the current situation that is today, um, the biggest challenge and something of big concern is the lack of basic facilities and especially water, wash and everything else for hundreds and thousands of people in transit. Right? So we have enormous number of people who are in transit today, walking on highways, walking on roads and wherever and every day you hear about, you know, a pregnant woman here, an old person there, young people walking, um, people dying because of dehydration. And I feel um, the longer this situation continues, it'll be the biggest number one concern on all of our minds and lack of basic facilities, including water to all these people. Uh, yes, there are bigger, there are other issues in uh, places where people are located in, within say cities or villages. But I would say a biggest problem today, especially if you see from the wash or water perspective, is that of people in transit who are trying to reach back home. Yeah. Thanks, Sundar. Uh, Tini? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, uh, Madhavan. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. So in terms of the issues that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think are there, one is, of course, the whole thing of wash in urban areas. Uh, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with more severe um, uh, impact in urban centers and uh, things like, you know, how can you ensure physical distancing where uh, living spaces are anyway so uh, constrained and so small. So there's crowding at a common, uh, uh, say, community community sanitation facilities or community hand washing platforms. So I think the wash in urban spaces issue, that's, uh, uh, you know, something which is um, uh, something that, you know, we should look at. I also feel that the access, similar to what, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sundar has also mentioned, the access to water and hygiene uh, products for regular hand washing, that is uh, a challenge. 
I feel the gender issue, similar to all crisis situations which affect gender, uh, women perhaps much more, uh, women have been burdened much more with the responsibility of actually having to source water, collect water, ensure uh, hygiene within the home, uh, also uh, you know, visit banks and all of that to get uh, uh, the money. So I think the work burden of women has increased and I think we need to look at uh, uh, that aspect. The whole issue of migrants that we are seeing, perhaps uh, we need to rethink the development paradigm uh, and you know, rather than concentrating work opportunities in urban centers, perhaps we could think of um, you know that kind of uh, uh, diversification moving uh, work opportunities closer to where people are actually uh, uh, based so i think the migrant uh, uh, issue is also something that uh, you know has emerged as a, a, a thing that we should uh, look at and address thanks Tini. can we just quickly go to vedika and then to yamini so vedika what do you see as sort of the challenges that have emerged yeah, uh, thanks, Madhavan, and thanks for uh, having me here uh, in, in this conversation. So a lot of really good points have been made by uh, all the other speakers. So I really wanted to look at it from a different angle and look at it from the angle of uh, financial institutions uh, as well as the communities they serve. So as you rightly said, uh, our focus uh, has been to work with a large variety of financial institutions across uh, 23 states. Uh, where uh, the financial institutions are enabling uh, affordable financing uh, to the communities to build their water and sanitation assets. And, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about quickly about the challenges as well as uh, talk about some um, uh, silver uh, uh, or some light at the end of the tunnel. So in terms of the challenges, uh, you know, this has obviously become not just a health issue, but a significant economic and social issue. So all livelihoods have got uh, severely impacted, which means that uh, the resilience of the community or the ability of the community to either be uh, uh, service the existing loans and or take new loans has got severely impacted uh, in the short term. And uh, when they are able to uh, take new loans, obviously the focus is going to be immediately on some livelihood generation or some emergency needs. Similarly, from the uh, lender side, uh, you know, while they have uh, provided the moratorium and we work with banks, small finance bank, livelihood missions, MFIs, all of them. So while they have provided moratoriums to their borrowers, they necessarily have not got the same moratorium. So their liquidity constraints have also got severely uh, hampered. I think the second thing is when the moratorium period ends, uh, you know, one issue is of the ability to be able to service, but the second issue is also going to be in terms of whether the repayment culture gets vitiated and whether there are local, uh, you know, uh, uh, players who start saying you don't need to uh, repay any loan uh, at all. So I think that's the second issue. I think the third pretty big significant issue for all lenders, all micro lenders is gonna be whether there is a change in the models themselves. So lending, uh, whether through self-help groups or through joint liability groups has always been a very high touch point model, right? Where people get together in groups, their group meetings. How does that work? How does that evolve uh, in uh, the requirement of physical distancing? And the fourth challenge I would quickly mention is uh, it's pretty clear that the urban economies have got much more severely impacted than rural. And uh, you know, this week we, we were speaking to uh, probably 50 of our partners and we heard uh, a lot of uh, uh, experiences from them in terms of the urban uh, distress. Just to quickly turn on the positive side, and I do uh, want us to remember these positive sides as we look beyond the immediate time frame. I think one is the importance of access to safe water and sanitation in building the resilience is, is, has never been more clearer. It has never been more clearer among the communities because they've heard messages about hand washing, for example, but has also never been clearer among the financial institutions. They recognize that if their borrowers have access to safe water and sanitation, they are more resilient and hence better uh, customers. So that's one. And second, uh, every crisis does tend to bring about a change. So if we look at demonetization, for example, that brought about a big change where all disbursements 
uh, now happen online. 80 to 90% of all micro lending disbursements across all sorts of financial institutions happen online. 80 to 90% of collections right now happen in cash, but we think that this uh, COVID-19 might cause this behavior also to change uh, in the next weeks and months to come. Thank you. Thanks, Vedika. So Yamini, what do you think? What's happened with you know how we dealt with water sanitation hygiene during the lockdown and what are the implications of COVID-19 that we should be concerned about? Thanks, Madhavan. Uh, thanks for having me on this discussion. Um, the uh, disadvantage of being the last one uh, to speak is that everyone has said uh, all the most critical things much better than you could ever articulate it yourself. But the advantage is then one can uh, build on that uh, to think uh, going forward. So let me say, you know, I, I completely agree with everything that's been said. Uh, but if I were to draw from that, what are the three uh, big uh, sort of uh, issues that are, that are emerging? Um, I think, you know, essentially this whole experience of COVID has exposed some very, very significant fault lines in our policy making and in our uh, social uh, uh, in, in our social life and and uh, the the and that, that links very much to the challenge of water and sanitation as we see it, uh, it uh, in terms of how we've thought about urbanization, how we've thought about the movement, mobility and movement of people, the, the, the crisis of migrant workers uh, effectively uh, demonstrates that, how we think about public health itself, um, which links to the failures of water and sanitation historically that are now coming to bear. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think each of these have been articulated uh, very effectively by all the speakers before me. Uh, to my mind, I think uh, from a policy making and governance point of view, this sort of highlights uh, certainly the big gaps, but also uh, opens up, I think, possibilities of opening up um, a, th a new way of thinking about uh, 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 cha the, the challenge of uh, urban wa of water and sanitation. I've always felt that water and sanitation has traditionally been, even though the public health challenge is what uh, enables uh, um, policy engagement with the question with, with, with the question of water and sanitation, uh, the effective linkages uh, from a policy making point of view as well as from a communication point of view between the public health elements of water and sanitation. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the what it takes to sanitation have all departments function um, and the way in which the, the communication uh, uh, mobilizes at the ground level. Uh, I think this is the first time that uh, consequent to a disease, uh, just uh, the 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 the, the the core of uh, of water and sanitation, hand washing, which then opens up all the challenges of the lack of access to uh, 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 to, to pipe water supply and uh, the poor quality of sanitation comes together. And it comes together in a real, very real way. I think that the communication and messaging has, uh, in fact, because of the nature of the crisis and the way in which the policy environment has handled it, has actually gone down very strongly I think there is a general acknowledgement that hand washing is very critical to uh, addressing this particular public health crisis. But there still seems to me to be a huge gap in how our uh, uh, the, 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 the policy approach that we have taken uh, to be able to try and see how effectively to bridge this together. So you have one arm of policy making that's talking about the importance of hand washing from a medical perspective, but I'm not seeing what a PhD departments, uh, rural health, uh, rural water water supply uh, uh, and sanitation departments coming together uh, to chart out an effective strategy. So I think that's one very critical thing that we should think about in terms of uh, what the, uh, where and how we should go forward. Secondly, of course, the question of urbanization and just uh, urban planning, which uh, this whole uh, issue has brought to the fore. Uh, the fact that we chose to do a lockdown, despite the fact that most of our cities have very, very dense populations where lockdowns don't necessarily make sense. I 
think puts a very important spotlight on all of this. And the third thing that I think we need to probably think about going forward is the integ integration of the local economies um, and local governance structures with uh, water and sanitation. And I think all these three, uh, there are new opportunities that have emerged to reframe and reshape how we've been talking about water sanitation in this, in this context, which will lead to a more integrated approach going forward. Thanks very much, Yamini. I'm just going to quickly now follow up with some more specific questions to some of the panelists. And I'll start with Vedika. And Vedika, you've already talked a little bit about this in your opening remarks. Uh, I have two quick questions for you. One, has COVID-19 triggered a possible sort of uh, crisis in the, with regard to WASH-related loans? Mm -hmm. in the uh, MFI sector or wash related financial products? Is there likely to be a crisis triggered off by COVID where people are unable to repay? You also talked about fears of potentially, uh, you know, messaging being sent out saying you don't need to repay loans and therefore that triggering a collapse of some kind. Uh, so that's one question that do you sense that, you know, there has been a crisis triggered by COVID with regard to wash related financial products? And two, what are the other kinds of changes that you think will need to be institutionalized in terms of processes or even in, the, in terms of the product portfolio for MFIs dealing with wash products to be able to tide this period over? Sure. So uh, I think uh, to answer your first question, Madhwan, um, I don't think there's a crisis in terms of wash loans. I think there's a crisis in terms of overall lending. Uh, or overall portfolios uh, of the lenders. If we look across the lenders uh, and across states, I think for the largest uh, lend water and sanitation lender, the water and sanitation portfolio will be around 10 to 15% of their balance sheet. Uh, and this is for the largest. For uh, typically the number is around, you know, anywhere between one to 5% of the balance sheet. So really the challenge is on the overall uh, lending portfolio of uh, the lenders. And, and I think as, uh, uh, and, and that is going to be an issue for all lenders and they are, uh, you know, the moratorium, emergency facilities, uh, immediate loans in terms of helping them, uh, helping the borrowers gain livelihood, uh, guarantees, uh, all of these are going to help. Uh, in fact, if, uh, you know, anecdotally, and uh, let's see how it works out, but in the last uh, more than 15 years when uh, uh, it, lenders in India have been uh, making loans for water and sanitation, anecdotally, for some reason, the water and sanitation portfolio has always behaved slightly better than all the other loans uh, made by the same lenders. And it would be an interesting thing to see if that continues uh, during this process. But I, I think to your second question, yes, there are changes needed in the model. And I think the changes are in two, three respects. One, uh, much more expanded uh, product portfolio, right? So uh, look at not just the traditional building a new toilet or getting a water connection, but look at it uh, across, look at uh, the lenders will need to look at both household solutions as well as community solutions. Look at loans for small enterprises because we do think uh, there will be uh, many more enterprises coming through uh, in terms of either, uh, you know, a, a point was made on water quality. So uh, drinking water uh, uh, enterprises or even uh, uh, treatment enterprises. So uh, we think the lenders will need to be flexible to look at opportunities, not just uh, purely at the household level, but also uh, across uh, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in, in this space. And I think uh, the last point, uh, which, you know, uh, as I mentioned, we spoke to lenders across the country uh, during this week, and they all in one voice said how the mobile phone has been an incredible tool for them to reach out to the communities they serve. And we think the use of that, uh, you know, for spreading the right messages, uh, for um, creating awareness, uh, but also uh, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, onboarding new customers, for uh, processing loan applications, for collections. But, so the digitization of all processes, we think really needs to uh, accelerate and will accelerate uh, as a result of this. Thanks very much, Vedika. I'm going to switch to Yamini. Um, and Yamini, a couple of questions for you. Uh, one is to 
So do you think the crisis with regard to water sanitation hygiene is a bigger problem in urban India as compared to rural? And has that, you know, has, has COVID-19 revealed that to be true? And if yes, why? Uh, and the second is that, do you think that the, the, the nature of planning, designing for habitation settlements for the urban poor and the provision of water sanitation services for them is going to fundamentally change in the years ahead, given our experience of COVID-19? So, uh, Madhavan, uh, your first question, uh, in, in, it, it, it's a, it, it's, uh, I, I don't know whether it's appropriate to make that comparison simply because uh, the nature of how COVID is unfolding right now seems to be very much an urban phenomenon for the moment. I, I, you know, now that we've had this uh, huge flow of reverse migration, what implications that will have on rural India is an open question. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, of, it, it is very much a very, in fact, it's an urban phenomenon and it seems to be a very localized urban phenomenon so it's not uh, you're seeing outbreaks are emerging in what they're describing as hotspots but even within these hotspots the containment zones seem actually if you look at the testing data closely quite restricted to lanes gullies uh, uh, you know subsets of uh, of, of locations um, but uh, you know obviously uh, I, I think it's not so much the COVID itself but our response to COVID which is sort of expecting a very large scale shift in social behavior uh, that is uh, putting the spotlight on um, the, and, and putting the pressure in some ways, new kinds of pressures on urban uh, settlements because of the density of population and the lack of access to basic hygiene, which just the, the nature of uh, habitations in rural India uh, allow for a, so, uh, a, a lot more. So of course, pipe water supply is even scarcer in rural contexts, but there are there is a large, there are there are different ways in which one can adapt to both hygiene requirements as well as the physical distancing requirements in uh, rural contexts than in very uh, populated, uh, very densely populated urban contexts. Uh, so, in that sense, I think the pressures are significantly higher, and the prospects of things going wrong uh, are even greater because of, of the nature of uh, because of the uh, of the nature of the disease and because of population density. So, in that sense. This is, to, to, to my mind, for the moment at least, this is very much an urban phenomenon and it needs to be addressed uh, thinking much harder about urban water supply and sanitation, uh, which I think has always been a much, uh, it's been a more wicked problem to solve than rural sanitation, which is one of the reasons why you've seen less progress uh, in the urban context than in rural areas. And, uh, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for us to be thinking differently. I just worry that we're not thinking hard enough about this problem. I think uh, certainly uh, this has uh, put a very important spotlight on the nature of urban planning, uh, that how we've thought about urban housing, how we thought about urban sanitation for uh, particularly for migrant, for, for the large cluster of uh, migrant communities that come into cities uh, and work uh, in uh, and work in cities. But I think that, you know, a lot of how we think about the urban is going to change quite fundamentally over the next, over the course of the next six months. And it's going to change because of what Libby said, because we've had this massive reverse migration uh, that uh, is going to now, uh, uh, I think, uh, change how rural India thinks about movement. Uh, and, you know, of course, migration will, 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 once the economy gets back on track, if and when, uh, just the, the, the pressure of, of, of jobs will eventually bring people back into cities. But people are going to come back into cities in very different ways and forms. Uh, my understanding of migration, uh, uh, you know, in the early days, what one saw of people walking back home seemed to me to be a lot more of the short term casual migrant who was coming in for three, three months. And usually that's an individual, not a family. But over the course of the last two months, we've seen families now moving back en masse. And I think as soon as things open up, people are going to head back. And once people head back, it's not going to be, I don't, I don't conceive that families will come back 
into cities over the course of the next few years. This is uh, the impact has been quite significant in my understanding. Uh, so we're going to see a lot more of individuals coming back for work, probably large uh, cohorts of young men coming back for work rather than women and families. That will mean we have to think about urban housing and link to that, of course, urban sanitation and water supply very, very differently. So the frameworks we apply to urban planning will need to both address the immediate uh, crises, which, which by immediate, I mean actually medium term crises, as well as think of the larger challenge of how we can create housing and sanitation for uh, in our cities in ways for the long term that address uh, uh, the, the, the sharp for, uh, a fault line of sanitation that the COVID crisis has placed both public health and sanitation. It also means that we'll have to think very differently about the role of local uh, municipalities, uh, both in addressing public health as well as sanitation. And I hope that that would be the opportunity to converge public health and uh, water and sanitation uh, as a collective part of our planning process and policy making process. Thanks very much, Yamini. Um, I just quickly switched to a completely different issue, which strangely enough has got very little uh, attention at this point of time. And I want to pose this question to Sundar that, you know, while there's been a lot of chatter about uh, access to water, hand hygiene, it almost seems as if water quality is not a priority anymore. Um, and the question to you is that, uh, you know, I mean, do you think that these issues will now stop becoming important for, you know, in the short run till the COVID problem gets solved? Will people worry more about access and not about the quality of water? And if indeed this were to happen, what are sort of the short term, medium term implications of uh, completely dropping the ball with regard to water quality in this country? Yes, Madhavan, uh, <clears throat> what I'll try and do is to uh, go to a very specific example, a very small case study, and then uh, relate it to the wider question that you posed. Um, so this uh, situation is of a village called Jashoda Kumji in this district called Jhabwa. It's a very remote village. Till few years back, um, we didn't even have uh, roads reaching to the village. And uh, some of us have been working with communities in this village for, uh, for many years, I think now almost 10 years, uh, trying to convince people to shift to safer water sources because there are some water sources which are affected by poor water quality and water contamination, uh, specifically there uh, with respect to fluoride contamination. So the, the, the situation in some villages like these are that, are that you have hand pumps close to your house, which you can actually access, but they are contaminated. But then you have open wells, um, dug wells, which are much farther away from your house for most people, which are probably safer. And um, the entire communication uh, for many years has been to try and shift people to water sources, which are better for them, which are safer for them. Now in the last one month, uh, I would say last one or two months, something fascinating really uh, happened. So um, uh, this period is also the period of severe water scarcity, as we know everywhere, and um, even lesser and lesser water sources are, uh, are really available for people. Um, so naturally, you know, we saw crowding of people around very few water sources and this whole thing of social distancing really cropped up and people started thinking. Now, what this village did, uh, was something fascinating you know, and, we, and then we started observing how this could even go over to other places. Uh, what they did was very simple. They just had a bullock cart within the village, got one person to get one tank of water filled from the dug well, people contributing money to that person, that person gets a small level of employment and taking this bullock cart around the village. Right. So uh, there is this one well which has safe water and people do not want to travel all the way to this well and crowd it. So they figure out that, you know, there's this bullock cart here, there's we put money here and then we take it around. Uh, so what I would, what I'm, what, what I felt and what I'm also seeing broadly in a much, uh, much wider level is a couple of things. One is that uh, in some sense, uh, COVID is a wash and health problem, right? Not entirely, but uh, if you look at the entire uh, uh, issue of wash and health, and water quality, I would say, is one part of it. Uh, COVID is, uh, in part, a wash and health problem. So in some sense, the communication that is, that is now driving COVID and all the behaviors around it, there are many issues which are actually piggybacking on them and actually able to reach people. 
See, in some sense, I would say this is a tremendous opportunity, just like Swaj Bharat Mission was earlier. Uh, right now, it's also a tremendous opportunity to also bring, bring across various other health problems, such as water quality and health and various other issues and get people to act on it. That is point number one. So I see this as maybe a tremendous opportunity if we actually recognize it and design communication to actually ride along with COVID and reach people because the communication channels now are really strong. You have ASHA workers, Anganwadi workers, a and everybody talking about wash and health and hygiene to people. And that's 90% of their communication to people. That's point number one. Point number two from the same example is what you would have noticed is a very small local enterprise which has emerged by itself, right? So you have people paying small amounts of money to get this bullock cart going and then supply money. I would, all, I would like to borrow this term, not even local, but I would say hyper-local, borrow this term from the technology industry. Uh, there is probably opportunity for a lot of such local small enterprises to build up as a response, right? If you really want uh, an alternative to the, the Jal Jeevan mission uh, paradigm of reaching pipe water supply to every household, which today now looks um, really much more difficult by 2023, 24, uh, and reduce the burden of women to gather around water sources and still reach water to people. What you really need is simple stuff, simple small enterprises within villages, within communities to reach water to people, right? And stop crowding, right? So these are small opportunities. And I would say that especially water contamination, water quality, for me, water contamination, water quality, is just a problem of selection of water sources. Very rarely we find in any part of the country that every water source is contaminated. It's that a few water sources are always safe and it's about changing of behaviors of people to select these water sources. If we actually look at the current situation as an opportunity in terms of reaching out communication to people, carry it over these different channels of COVID and emphasize wash and health problems such as water quality, and trying to build small local enterprises to uh, within communities that helps to address this problem. I think we can actually make progress, which we would not have done in many years. Yes. Sounds, sounds very hopeful, Sundar. Thanks. Um, I just moved to Tini. Uh, Tini, what do you see as sort of the, you know, eventually children will go back to schools. You can't have them under lockdown forever. This belief that every child in this country has access to a, you know, a, a mobile device or a or the internet um, to study at home is a is a myth. So the reality is that kids will need to go back to school because schools are about a larger set of experiences, not just about learning. What are the wash challenges that we are likely to see uh, emerge in schools as children go back? Because historically, you know, all kids have gone and picked up infections in school, and so why should COVID be different? So how do you then? brace yourself, prepare yourself for it. And the second is slightly different, which is that, do you think with all of this emphasis on hand hygiene, water, uh, as a nation, we'll drop the ball on safely managed sanitation? So I'll take the second question first, Madhavan. Um, I think the linkages between our safe sanitation, health, have very clearly been, uh, uh, you know, demonstrated. So I don't see, uh, and now health is very much in focus. You know, a lot of our attention during this COVID-19 is on how can we secure the health of uh, uh, communities. So I don't think sanitation will take a backseat to say uh, issues around hand washing or access to water because both of these are so intrinsically linked. I would feel perhaps uh, we need to go further to actually now secure access to water, both for personal hygiene and also for sanitation, and also move to clean habitations. I mean, I would feel that perhaps now the focus should also be on ensuring clean habitations as places where health outcomes can be uh, secured better. And I feel a uh, concept of, say, One Health, where we look at, uh, uh, you know, healthy ecosystems, healthy environments, uh, healthy livestock, uh, uh, how is livestock handled, and then human health. Because 
all of these are so closely linked. And we've seen that pan out very well, strongly in the COVID-19 situation, where uh, uh, the genesis of this disease was actually, uh, I mean, it is a zoonotic disease. And I feel that that question also needs to be center stage. So I would not see a letting go of the focus on sanitation, definitely not, because it's so closely linked with uh, uh, health outcomes. And so, uh, and you know, it kind of completes the ecosystem. On the first point, um, yes, the issue of children going back to school is definitely something uh, you know that we all really need to think through. Many of the schools, particularly in rural areas, are currently quarantine centers. And whenever uh, things normalize and children, I would feel that perhaps children would, uh, going back to school, going back to universities, would perhaps be the last in the whole process normalization because uh, uh, children i mean we don't have the space to keep children uh, you know at, a, at the physical distance norms in schools would be difficult to kind of uh, uh, manage uh, children uh, uh, drinking water at common uh, 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 you know drinking water stations how would you actually manage that so i think uh, the protocols for how schools can be made more secure would have to be drafted very carefully there would be a lot of responsibility on teachers to actually ensure that every child who's coming to school is well and is not suffering from a fever. I mean, that kind of a protocol would need to be put in place. So we would need to build the understanding of our teachers uh, uh, you know, much more. A lot of the schools have been our quarantine centers currently in rural areas, particularly. These would need to be disinfected uh, very well. So, you know, what would be the pro protocols around uh, all of that? But we need to visualize when children come back to school because that's going to normalize the whole situation. I mean, children staying back at home for such a long period of time hasn't been, uh, I mean, very, not all of them have access to digital platforms to actually learn. So uh, I feel we need to think through this better and how can we uh, actually ensure that guidelines are developed and the capacity of our teachers is built to be able to follow these guidelines. Thanks very much, uh, Kenny. So Libby, a couple of quick questions for you. One is that, you know, so we talked a little bit with Sundar about uh, water quality. Do you think that with this emphasis on making sure that you're going to get water for hand hygiene with increased requirements for it, the focus will revert back entirely to just seeing it as a distribution problem. Uh, and the emphasis required for ensuring sustainability of the source uh, to be able to guarantee and assure water for the future, that's going to fall by the wayside. I mean, do you see this as a likelihood uh, where we will start to focus on this as a distribution problem and lose sight of the need for investing in sustainable sources? And the second is that there is now more than ever before an urgency to promote pipe water supply. Uh, but the fact is that we've had significant setbacks in terms of it's going, this can't be a priority for district administrations for a long time. Um, so in some sense, the 2024 dream will either have to be pushed back or might not get realized. But is there a likelihood that governments will start to look at build, operate, transfer, uh, transfer as a solution? to solving the problem really quickly in a short span of time, or start giving out contracts for enterprises to say, you build, you get the infrastructure in place, get all the pipes and taps up to a household level, we'll pay you for operation maintenance for five years. And that becomes the route for quick uh, gains rather than investing in building local capacity and ownership over the systems. Well, uh, Madhavan, I'd like to think that water sustainability will continue to be a focus area, both for policy and also practice. I think the reality is going to be very disappointing. Uh, I say this for uh, several reasons, but most primarily uh, across rural India, access to safe water is still uh, not a fulfilled uh, wish. And it's just only totally recently that government of India went into a big, big mission mode to do to ensure access of tap water to every household. So I think that uh, focus on access is going to remain, but the Jaljeevan mission, uh, which was expected to gather steam on ground by the end of this year is likely to get delayed. There are now very, very severe uncertainties because uh, finance of course will go into, is going to be the bigger one. The Jaljeevan Kosh was to be built using CSR uh, 
contribution substantially, but where is CSR contribution in the given uh, uh, given economic uncertainty with PM between PM cares and the uh, you know bleak business situation? I think that dream has gone away. Now, 3.6 lakh crore rupees is what was originally envisaged to be invested by the state, both the government of India and the state government. We don't know if that money is going to come. So to me, the, the, the whole question of distribution and access itself is now a big question mark before we get to sustainability. Now, in the broader context, the sustainability was to come through convergence with MGNRVGS. Uh, in the in the good days, getting NREGS to behave in a watershed approach to plan and implement in a water natural resource conservation approach has been very difficult. Now, with all these uh, talks about MGNREGS being diversified into you know multiple multiple employment generation ways, I don't know where the money for such sustainability efforts is going to come, even in uh, you know the smaller rural pockets where watershed development is seen as something that is necessary. So overall, my, my current belief is that we are staring at a bleak situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis focus and efforts to ensure sustainability of water because the demand for water is, is still a big, big, drinking water is still a big issue. On your second point on the uh, service, uh, more the business uh, revenue model of, of water supply, uh, let's accept that this is already happening across rural India. Water tankers are private businesses. So it's not that... Uh, by default, private enterprise is not there. I, I was quite uh, interested in what uh, Sundar was saying about the hyperlocal uh, supply model. But see, the issue is uh, it's not just availability of water that is a new aspiration, it's availability of tap water. So I don't think the policy is going to change uh, on that. It is going to be focused on tap water and the uh, supposed and obvi obvious uh, health and uh, hygiene benefit from having tap water at home, not, not to mention the gender aspect of that. But uh, I think the cost of operations of a water supply system in most of rural India does not permit a, a, a model where private enterprise may flourish because certainty of government paying for a duandum uh, contractually or even otherwise is not something that uh, I believe private entrepreneurs would be uh, uh, would be very confident about uh, even if the uh, government is willing to pay for it actual cash flow difficulties of working with the government will lead to substantial fall of confidence so uh, uh, is it desirable is is an entirely different uh, uh, you know uh, discussion and i would not want to go there but fr from a pure feasibility point of view i don't think any large change in approach is likely to happen Thank you. Thanks, Libby. And I'll just quickly sort of go to Ghazala, who's been waiting. Um, Ghazala, you know, do you think that in the past we've had major flagship programs uh, on sanitation, now recently on pipe water supply, but do you think we've missed a trick by not focusing on hand hygiene, even whilst focusing on sanitation, and that is proving to be now a barrier for us in COVID times. Uh, the second question I have for you is that, you know, based on what you're seeing in Kutch and in Chhattisgarh and your prior experiences, do you think the burden on women, adolescent girls, given COVID-19 has actually gone up with regard to water sanitation and hygiene? Yeah. Thank you, Madhavan. Uh, I think firstly that uh, this whole thing of, uh, I don't want to separate water sanitation with hand washing because I think they are all very interdependent, very interconnected. Uh, without, uh, like, you know, as we have seen in the past when sanitation toilets have been constructed and there was no water, the toilets were not being used. So I think it's very important to look at this entire thing in a very holistic manner. And uh, I agree that, you know, you know, hand washing or, you know, the component of hand washing has never been a kind of focus, uh, neither in schools, nor in the house, nor in the community spaces where, you know, women, men, children, they all come together. So there is, there is always been, you know, uh, kind of uh, this whole hand washing issue has been sidelined. Uh, especially when we look at, uh, you know, we know that in our country like India, where there's so many cases of diarrhea and other, other hygiene issues, where this, this becomes so important. 
you know, to tie, to bring uh, into focus this whole issue of hand washing. But uh, I think somewhere now with COVID and uh, lockdown and everything, you know, uh, people have started talking about uh, hand washing. But I would say that, you know, uh, this needs much more investment because it is also a behavioral issue. It can't be like, you know, water, which is physical, which you provide through, through, rain, through different techniques, pipe water, rainbow water harvesting structures and things like that. But when it comes to hand washing, it is more or, you know, it's more of, more of behavioral issue. And that has, I think, never been uh, thought. That there's never been uh, into the main uh, debate or into the, you know, kind of, no schools teach you. It's such a simple thing, but nobody, you know, even schools, spaces like where children have to learn by examples, there are not enough uh, hand washing stations or, you know, there are classes or they have been taught about it. So I think it, it's, a, it's an issue which we have to really wake up on because uh, we have to focus on hand washing. We have to focus on bringing the underrepresented also into a decision making, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, environment because uh, normally it happens that uh, women are, you know, women, when we talk about women or adolescent girls, they are basically the service they provide because water is normally uh, in the hands of uh, you know when when getting water from a, uh, from a well or a hand pump or a space you know is a women's responsibility but when it comes to taking decision on uh, availability of water using it the way you want uh, it's never been uh, they have never been in the forefront so i think this is the this is the time when uh, uh, the issue has to be highlighted the issue has to be brought into forefront and things have to be things have to be uh, also looked at uh, not from a very piped water but you know because there are a lot of areas which are still which doesn't have water doesn't have pipe water people buy water they also like you know i would give one example uh, you know in this period and people are digging digging holes and taking water so getting one one pot of water takes three hours for a woman to sit and you know slowly slowly in the vidas of kach uh, take water and fill her pots three pots walk home so it's been it's been a kind of a very very uh, uh, kind of a precarious situation and in that context i think looking telling them that you have to wash your hands uh, you know this many times a day uh, you know kind of you know motivate them it is it isn't possible uh, also, I was just imagining what what happens. You know, I think uh, uh, I think uh, Yamini and others spoke about it. That what happened when women are in transit. When I am looking at uh, you know when watching TV, looking at uh, the way situation is, women are walking for three days, four days. What comes to my mind is where are they? Where are the toilets? Where are the public spaces where they want to wash hands? Women are menstruating. They are giving birth on the road, and there has been no concern for. Things, such a simple thing like you know you have to keep yourself clean you have to be have your personal hygiene where are those spaces where are those uh, where are the decision makers who have never never thought of such things in the wider spectrum of you know taking uh, making all kind of announcements of uh, you know things which are which look so you know kind of alien so I think it's uh, it's been a very very uh, and I think I think COVID should should be taken up as a kind of you know because this is something which is so life threatening and uh, it's so important for the you now wash is becoming very very important in this whole whole uh, discussion and I think we should be talking to the policymakers and we should be influencing them to to kind of bring that on forefront. Thank you. Thanks, Gasala. I'm going to just open this up to the entire panel <clears throat> and uh, give you all a chance to ask one of the other members of the panel a question. Anyone that you'd like to ask, uh, you can just raise your hand and then go first. Uh, if there's an opportunity to ask someone else on the panel a question, why don't you go ahead? Who wants to go first? Um, so yeah, I, this is Tini here. Yeah. 
so Ghazala, I mean, in your work uh, in, uh, you know, rural areas and in Kach, uh, like for us, the question that Madhavan asked me as children go back to school and all of that, but we also see issues around access to infrastructure being very limited. I mean, you know, in schools, unbiased centers, and I think one of the participants has also asked this question that where access to a basic infrastructure is not there in, say, an Anganwadi center or in a school, how do we ensure that, you know, this, uh, the norms around hand washing are adhered to? So are there any best practices from, you know, the work that you've done that, you know, could be emulated or taken to scale, uh, uh, you know, because we need to now plan also for uh, the situation to normalize and children to go back to school and Anganwadi centers to start opening. So also in the context of a question uh, that has come up from one of our participants on this. Yes. I think uh, uh, it uh, best is to, you know, we have examples where we have done uh, in Anganwadi, like you are. Uh, spoke about Anganwadi. I think Anganwadi is such an important place. And uh, we saw when we were working, while working in Kutch, we saw women, Anganwadi workers didn't have a space to wash their hands or go to the toilet. And that is something which we felt was so important where there are such young children and they're handling them, they're providing them with meals, they have to have their hand properly washed and you know clean and everything. So which what we thought we did was we also uh, uh, promoted rain roof water harvesting structures over there. Uh, so that you know there is enough water in the in the anganwadi for hand washing of children from anganwadi worker helper people who are, are preparing food and also good practice for children to see that you know hands are washed and i think it, it it's very good because it has created examples where children have gone back home and told their parents that before i eat i have to wash my hands so i think these are these are very small very small things which can bring in behavioral change it can bring in accessibility to resources so that you know one learns to uh, you know kind of practice things and also uh, uh, in, in get it ingrained into their day to day lives Madhavan, if i may make a quick point on the rainwater harvesting and sure. uh, uh, and I, I think that's a really, really important point. And when you asked me earlier, uh, do you see the, uh, you know, the behavior of the financial institutions changing, for example? And one of the things which we do see uh, increasing is exactly uh, things like this, emphasis on rainwater harvesting, whether at an individual household level or at a community level. And I think there is a behavior change component also involved with that because uh, one of the things which we've heard from communities is water stored is not as good as fresh water. And so there is a behavior change component involved in that. But I, we do think that uh, because the realization is so high across communities that if I have access to uh, water and sanitation at my household, my resilience, my family's resilience to either COVID or any other disease increases substantially. We think this would be a really opportune time to be talking about uh, rainwater harvesting, whether at the household level or at a community level. Thanks, Vedika. I think Libby has his hand up and I'll then come to you, Yamini. Yeah, Libby, go ahead. Yeah, I was, to, this is to Vedika. And um, I was just talking about how Jaljeevan Mission is likely to face a huge uh, shortage of funds to meet the demand. Uh, is there already discussions happening around in the financing world where some new model other than the micro credit approach is being uh, envisaged? So I think it's a great question, Libby. And uh, the initial view of the Daljeevan uh, model, if you remember, was 90% of the financing will come from the government and 10% from the uh, communities. I think now, given all the stress on the government financing and the funds getting allocated to different sectors, this is the time to actually rethink that paradigm, right? And rethink how we can do blending uh, by inviting in the private sector, whether it's the financial institutions or the corporates. The short answer to your question is, yes, there have been some uh, beginnings of new models developing at an enterprise level. But uh, I would say this is the time to really scale that up and probably nudge it by a couple of policy measures, right? So for example, uh, you know, if, if the RBI were to say uh, for a limited period of say next five years, all financial institutions need to have X percentage of their priority sector lending dedicated towards water and sanitation. We think that would bring about, a, it, it would force innovation 
in terms of models around enterprises. It's a little bit of a stick, but uh, it's probably uh, the right thing to do at, at this time. Another thing might be the government saying, you know, we have limited resources, but why don't we use that some part of that money to give an interest subvention? whether it's for enterprises or households. Again, that will trigger uh, more thinking and more brains getting uh, focused on this. So we, we do think that's the need of the R uh, in terms of the policy. Thanks, Vedika. Yamini, had a question? Sorry, forgot to unmute myself. So I was actually curious, uh, just listening to everyone, uh, the, the you know, what this whole experience of the last two months and potentially the future uh, of managing uh, the, the COVID is sort of pointing to is how, uh, as, you know, one single virus has impacted every single aspect of our social and economic lives. And, uh, you know, e effectively, essentially, we are talking about, therefore, a very, the need for a very integrated policy approach to addressing uh, things going forward. And, uh, you know, especially listening to Libby and Vedika Ghazala, I mean, from, it, it goes from how we do natural resource management to how we are thinking about programs like Narega, which, uh, you know, have an element of uh, natural resource management embedded in them to how we're thinking about schooling, uh, nutrition. Uh, so, you know, in, in a sense, this seems to me as somebody who's been obsessed with how siloed our approaches to, uh, uh, to, to development is, it seems to be this is an opportunity to think about integration in a sensible way. And I was just wondering, you know, from the point of view of, uh, you know, are then our local governance institutions, whether it's a panchayat or the municipalities, useful? anchors to think about for that and what would it take and I was just you know curious to get your uh, perspectives on uh, both is that the right way of thinking about it do we have the institutional mechanisms but they need to be mobilized or is there a vacuum that needs to be filled number one and number two uh, in order to do this uh, what are the kinds of critical uh, capacity gaps that need to be filled can I can I ask Libby to try and have a go at answering that Yes, uh, I'm very glad, uh, Yamni, that you brought that one element into the discussion now uh, about local governments. Um, the 15th Finance Commission is apparently uh, gearing towards asking panchayats to use 50% of its funds towards water and, and sanitation, water, you know, stress and sanitation and de-stress. But I think right now the need of the R is a certain blind trust in the ability of gram panchayats to do it. Uh, this is a time to let go of the fear of uh, the audit, the CAG audit and all the, you know, the vigilance commission and all that. We have to trust that our local leaders, our local people have the ability to plan for themselves. And what is the, what is the way to do that? Because panchayats are a state subject, there is very little that the union can do is to get panchayats and municipalities to do for themselves what we've been asking others to do for them. I think strengthening the gram panchayats with complete devolution of funds and fu functions are there and functionaries will come. But if we can devolve funds to the greatest extent without waiting for state governments to issue guidelines on how they are to be used, I think this is the right time to do that. Great. Thanks, Libby. So I, uh, I'll just add to Libby. I'll just add to Libby. I think, uh, uh, you know, given that uh, uh, our local institutions are closest to the community, they are also the best place to actually build the knowledge in the community among, you know, norms that need to be followed and also get community support for infrastructure that is lacking in these areas. So I think I agree with what Libby says that uh, the, our local institutions, uh, and these could be community institutions, women's federations, self-help groups. I mean, these community institutions exist, Yamini. So it's not that anything new has to be created. Urban local bodies, they're all there. I think now we actually have to invest in them where capacities lack, perhaps uh, invest in building that knowledge, building that capacity to be able to take the lead on these uh, issues. So decentralization is going to be very uh, important and we need to support uh, those processes. These, uh, these institutions are closest to the community. They can also galvanize community support for things that are required. So I think that's very, very essential and perhaps a key learning from what um, uh, you know, we've gone through these last two months. 
we have time for one more question that each any one of you can ask somebody else. Agasala, why don't you go ahead? I have to unmute. Gazala, we can't hear you. Gazala, we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was on mute. Yeah, I also want to add to what uh, yeah, Tini, Yamini, Libby, Yeshik, Vedika has been talking about. I think I want to say that uh, it's also important that when we're talking about policy level change and things like that, we also, and Panchayat, the pan role of Panchayat is you know, undebatable. It adds to be, they have to be uh, taking a very important uh, player, very important role. Also, but with that, I think it's also respecting the traditional ways of doing things. You know, rather than always talking about technology and bringing in something from outside, I think it's very, very important. And that we, you know, in the, in the, in the mid past years, we have completely kind of eroded it. So rather than, you know, bringing, because there is this, this community knowledge, this traditional knowledge, people have survived uh, with whatever resources they had. And it has been a successful uh, examples of years and years of, uh, you know, how traditional methods were used and conserved and, you know, kind of, uh, enjoyed and had benefit people had benefited so i think that focus also has to be brought in with the policy which is i think very very uh, crucial at this stage point of time if i otherwise, can make a sorry otherwise there are a lot of communities who are socially excluded who are underrepresented who are not geographically they are in a very precarious situation they are very far flung they'll nev never be able to achieve uh, benefit from the uh, uh, whatever has whatever will come through uh, uh, through the policies and through the technology because we have seen it in the past also and we are and it will be more and more difficult now after post covid when every the rehabilitation will take its own time you know there will be few years we have completely gone back we have whatever we did we have actually gone back so we have to now uh, see how best we can do things so that we are, we can achieve more and more and can be reached out to people who are unreached thank you so vedika quickly and then yamini yeah, no, I, I just wanted to respond to what Yamini said. As somebody who's a relative newbie in the development sector, I agree with you that uh, it's a, you know frustrating that we work in silos. And I think it would be a shame if we fritter away this opportunity almost to work together. And while some great points have been made about local institutions and letting them do what they, uh, they can do, I also think there is uh, an increased opportunity to uh, work together, even at the policy level and in Delhi across uh, uh, ministries, not just uh, at the community level. Yamini, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, just build on what Ghazala said. I think uh, the, the, the centrality of traditional ways of doing things and the centrality of the community uh, in building its own forms of uh, resilience, marrying traditional ways of developing resilience in moments of crisis, combined with, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the many learnings over, uh, you know, the, uh, the many decades of, of, of work with communities. This is the time for us as a community, as a uh, sort of uh, group of people who in some ways play the role of mediating between communities and uh, technocratic approaches uh, to maybe think a lot harder about how we have tried to define the community um, and 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 you know uh, just uh, it's, it's just sort of Ghazala trigger a thought so what I have to say is very un, uh, it's poorly articulated but I do think that often what we have done is uh, under my in in talking about community and community participation and community engagement we've done so somewhat instrumentally perhaps to and and uh, less so in terms of actually thinking about what genuine strengths communities have to be able to present those to, uh, uh, to the policy making world and, and think about policy making in ways that don't have to see community as instrumental leverage for achieving whatever they want. So, you know, when the government talks about more working capital to self-help groups as instrumentally leveraging it for some local thing that they want to do, uh, you know, if we can, uh, I, I think it's for us to shape what that means um, and for us as a community to maybe debate community a little bit more and its traditions uh, in a more proactive and positive way. A great point, uh, Yamini. I'm just going to ask Sundar, who's kept quiet through this round. 
Uh, so, sir, do you want to sort of respond to what Yamini just said now or earlier or anything else? Sorry, actually, I went off the call for a bit here. Yeah, so one thing uh, I feel a big crisis definitely, you know, which uh, people coming back and then for the next six months or a year or so is going to be livelihoods on ground in the sense that the biggest thing on people's mind is definitely going to be basic livelihoods, money and you know, carrying their basic lives forward. So it's for every sector, I mean, here in the wash sector, for any other sector, to be then thinking of working very closely with the livelihood sector. In the sense that, um, say, uh, say for example, if uh, we have something like the Jal Jeevan mission, which is anyway going to be uh, crippled for finance, which uh, going ahead and taking its, um, um, taking its mission ahead, uh, it's probably uh, right time to reimagine Jal Jeevan mission as something much more localized and something which uh, creates meaningful jobs locally. You know, uh, yes, the program has been talking about uh, a million women uh, working on ground and, and a lot of that. But then let's imagine also the skill that people coming back also have. You, know, you have uh, masons coming back. Uh, so many of these people are uh, working in the construction industry. Uh, you have a lot of plumbers coming back. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe we actually now have an opportunity to, uh, to take ahead programs like Jal Jeevan Mission in a very different way, you know, in the sense of community coming forward, not just to plan programs, not just to plan their resources, but also in being able to have the skills to execute it, right? The question then comes about, uh, do they really have the skill, right? How much do we trust that skill? Can, we, can they really execute programs? And uh, over there, I think there is the role of technology in the sense on of new forms of engagement in the sense of reaching out to villages in a, in a mass scale, trying to get uh, people on ground, uh, build their capacities on things which the wash sector has never engaged, but then build capacities in terms of now, let's say constructing pipelines, uh, constructing a mini water supply system which always has been under the purview of contractors who didn't come in and execute it. But what about communities themselves executing these programs completely, right? Now, what capacities need to be built for doing that uh, could be, you know, a, 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 a reinvention, a reimagining of uh, programs such as Jal Jeevan Mission, and then uh, the livelihood and wash sector actually maybe working together right, very closely. Uh, you know, within that aspects like gender and equity will play out a lot, right? It will play out, play out a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, when you talk about jobs coming locally, when you talk about migrants coming back, when you talk about uh, skills, then uh, the aspect of who actually takes ahead, uh, takes ahead these programs will come in. And I think the future is going to be uh, in some sense very uncertain with respect to this. But if we reimagine, uh, if we try to show examples in terms of civil society uh, organizations, uh, to look at small water supply programs and small water supply schemes as something which communities can totally execute, not just plan, we might be showing a way forward for uh, closer integration between livelihood and uh, wash sector. So maybe uh, the panel for you know, so their responses, someone to um, you know their thoughts on this. Thanks very much, uh, Sundar. I'm just going to quickly try and look at some of the questions that have sort of emerged in the question answer thing and then I'm going to pose these. So what I'm going to do is just I'm going to read out a couple of questions and also mention whom I'd like to answer uh, these questions. Um, so one of the questions that's come up, uh, which, you know, I, you know, Ghazala Atini, one of you can answer is that uh, how do you deal with this issue of, you know, no infrastructure or poor infrastructure uh, in Anganwadi centers, particularly in rural areas? Uh, what do you deal with? How do you address this issue of, uh, you know, the lot of Anganwadi centers have no hand washing facilities. So how do you then start to deal with the issue of hand hygiene in that context? Uh, here's a, I mean, so, uh, Sundar, you should have a look at this chat box. There's a fan of yours who's emerged uh, here. Uh, there's also a question, uh, which is a generic question. Maybe Tini, you should answer the first one Ghazala can about Anganwadi centers is that, you know, can they be wash trainings? Uh, and TOTs uh, in rural areas for NGOs to then uh, start to take on this work. Uh, here's, a, here's a question for, uh, you know, maybe Sundar to answer, which is that, you know, there seems to be this assumption that there are sanitizers available in rural areas. And so 
how are people going to address this issue of hand hygiene if sanitizers are not there in rural areas? Uh, and a question for Yamini, which is, uh, what do you see as the role of common citizens and private sector uh, in ensuring sort of equitable, inclusive wash services in urban areas? And uh, then a question for uh, uh, Libby, which is, what do you see as the mechanism for convergence of services? Uh, you, you know, and what is the platform to do that? Uh, you know, is that going to be panchayats and municipalities? Is there something else that you can see? Um, and a question here for you, Vedika, which is that, uh, uh, what do you sort of see as the impact of this reverse migration uh, in terms of wash services in the urban area? So why don't you all have a go at this? Ghazala, do you want to go first? Yeah. I, yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much for that question from the participant. Uh, I think it's important that, uh, you know, we, uh, as, an, uh, as a country, also then it comes to the question of local governance, uh, you know, enhancing the local institutions, uh, accountability of the, uh, from, from the duty bearers. I think this is, this is important because uh, these, are, these, are the, these are the very primary uh, structures, primary, uh, you know, Anganwadi where a child goes when he's just three and it's a very important uh, uh, kind of an aspect of one's life. So I think it's, uh, it's, it can start from there and, you know, I think it's also to do with uh, how long-term vision and investments are going in into promoting uh, uh, water availability, uh, behavioral changes, and will, at, a, at a very smallest unit of a village or a hamlet even, you know, it, it can play a very important role. I think communities uh, should take responsibility along with the uh, panchayats and the local leaders, and they should be uh, there should be ways of looking at how village level health and sanitation committees, which are already mandated to take uh, this issue of uh, train, you know, hand washing, water availability. The committees also uh, because it also talks about health, it talks about sanitation. So it's a quite an integrated uh, kind of a committee which has to be activated, which has to be, which are there most of the times on papers, but this doesn't actually become fun very active and functional. So I think this is something it should start from there. It is ground zero level, I think. From there, if it starts, I think it can take a very big uh, uh, jump. Uh, and it can it can then multiply at all the levels because you know I think Anganwadi's are a very well networked uh, 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 kind of a mechanism in our country. I think it's the biggest uh, mechanism where every village and hamlet can be reached out. So I think these are the these are the very simple and uh, practical uh, examples how it can be activated and can become more functional. Thanks, Ghazala. Now, Tini, uh, and now I just request all the other panelists, we're sort of running short of time, so if you could be sort of really succinct. Tini, next. So I think, uh, I think in terms of access to sanitation and uh, water services for Anganwadi schools, we'll have to be a bit innovative, think out of the box. As uh, Sundar said, you know, the, the reverse migrants, there are many skills that the reverse migrants had. So could we look at that, you know, low cost hand washing stations? Could, could that be made out at the local level? The roof rainwater uh, example that uh, uh, Ghazala shared. So we'll have to be innovative to facilitate access to uh, uh, both sanitation and hand washing at um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, places where there isn't that uh, facility. On the uh, um, you know uh, a question uh, comment that came from one of the participants, and I think that is definitely something that you know we can uh, we can do. We can put together say an online uh, uh, training on you know. Uh, watch security at uh, habitation level and uh, you know all like-minded institutions we could come together and actually develop such a training program so I think that's a very good suggestion and something that we could uh, action Yamini Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, there, there's many different ways of answering that question, but I'll narrow down on just one, uh, which is that uh, uh, there is a uh, very important role for employers uh, to play in ensuring occupational uh, safety. Uh, and this is something that needs to be taken very, very seriously going forward. Um, and uh, it needs to be handled in a careful way, which uh, doesn't put employers into the hands of the coercive power of the state 
at the same time uh, ensures that employers are held accountable for ensuring that basic sanitation facilities, cleanliness facilities, and hygiene facilities are well in place, uh, especially in the manufacturing industry. Uh, Yamini Sundar? Yeah, on the sanitizer, uh, uh, san sanitizers thing, you know, every day on WhatsApp, I keep getting photos from ground of all these Jugard um, <clears throat> hand washing stations. And people seem to be, you know, figuring their way out. For me, it's a question of more of a mind shift and change of behaviors and messages reaching people's minds rather than, uh, uh, rather than a lack of, uh, you know, uh, soaps or, or, or sanitizer. Yes, it is, it is, it is, it is an issue. For a, a certain section of the population, it is an issue. But for a large section of our population, they'll do it if they want to do it. Um, and uh, people are figuring their way out. Uh, the concern for me is, however, how long will it continue? You know, it all looks great when you get a WhatsApp photo or a video, you know, Jugard hand washing station, it's there. But then is it going to sustain when the first rains hit? Is it going to continue longer? So those are definitely going to be questions, which are more questions of behaviors and attitudes rather than, uh, I would say, lack of resources to do it. Right? So this is how uh, I would approach you know, the whole question of uh, hand washing. Thanks, Sundar. Vedika? Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of the impact of reverse migration, I would quickly talk about negative and positive. So on the rural areas, it's been talked about much more stress on the same water resources, much more stress on the same sanitation facilities. So there is a chance uh, we'll slip back into open defecation, much more stress on the women and the girl's child, girl child to uh, uh, lift water. On the positive side, on the rural areas, I think uh, the, it's been talked about skills coming back. So many more opportunities for local entrepreneurship. And in terms of impact on the urban areas, again, on the negative side, the impact of reverse migration is going to be skill gaps you know, people moving back to, uh, to the rural, rural areas. But I'm hoping uh, on the positive side, there's much more impetus now to look at decentralized uh, water sanitation uh, solutions, you know, and not just depend on the big uh, schemes of uh, pipe water supply or big schemes of sewage, but much more emphasis on uh, quicker decentralized solutions, uh, roping in and crowding in the private sector. Thanks. Libby? Yeah, on the convergence uh, of services, the question, I think uh, in the context of rural India, there are the four most important and significant platforms that are available, most likely within one kilometer, one and a half kilometer for ev of every rural household in this country. The first is the women's self-help group. The second is the Anganwadi. The third is a primary school. And the fourth is the Gram Panchayat. Any convergence of any significance can happen at, in, in one, of, one or more of these four institutions that are already available. Unfortunately, what is blocking this is, because, is the fact that convergence is a government scheme. In our heads, in the, in, in, for people that matter, convergence is a scheme, convergence is a target to be achieved, and convergence is not a way of doing things. So as long as that block remains, I don't think any of our discussions around convergence makes much sense. But if somebody is willing to bell the cat, those four institutions that I just listed are sufficient to meet 80, 90% of the needs of convergent action. Thanks, Libby. Unfortunately, we sort of run out of time. Uh, I would have liked ideally to have gone back to all of you and asked you for one positive takeaway. But since we've run out of time, I'm going to quickly try and based on some of the things that you've said, I'm going to try and wrap this up by focusing on three or four critical things that have emerged from this conversation, thanks to you all. And I'm going to quote you all liberally in doing so. One is that, one, we need to ensure, we need to secure access to water. That's our first priority, as Stinney said, and that needs to be an emphasis moving ahead. I think it's quite clear from this conversation that hand hygiene has not really been a priority. And it's something that we will have to focus on. Uh, COVID-19 has focused the spotlight on hand hygiene. We need to use this opportunity to try and spread this because the long-term public health benefits are going to be enormous and we need to sort of take this forward. Uh, the point that Vedika made about the fact that there are going to be new products, for example, rainwater, roof rainwater harvesting, but more importantly, we're going to see how mobile phones are actually potentially going to become a disruptor in the way transactions start to take place in this space. 
And I'm going to end with probably two of the most important, three of the most important takeaways from this conversation. One was about the fact that we need to look at integration and we need to recognize that local institutions of self-governance are probably the best place to do it. And this is probably the, of, of the biggest opportunity that we have been we have provided with, which is, can we start to look at integrating using local institutions self-governance, whether it's your urban local body or whether it's your gram panchayat, and to actually invest in building capacities and then to do what Libby said, which is to trust them and to leave your fear behind. Uh, and I think that's one very critical message. The last is there's a huge opportunity for looking at integration uh, also and collaboration between other sectors and particularly for the livelihood sector and the wash sector and to look at hyperlocal enterprises as a ways to solve for problems around wash at a community level. And lastly, to leave it with this idea that Yamini also very powerfully talked about, which is to stop looking at communities as mere instruments for delivery, but to maybe start to have a conversation about how we start to, what, what, is, what do communities mean for us? And how do we try and engage with them in a more meaningful manner, which also addresses concerns around inequity, inequality that exist and might get you know, worsened during this time. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank you all, Ghazala, Vedika, Sundar, Shtini, Yamini, and Libby for joining this panel discussion. It's been great having you all here. Uh, stay safe and well. Thank you for all those who joined, the participants who joined. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but thanks everyone. Be safe. Thank Bye. you. Thank thanks you a lot. So Bye. Bye. Thank you.